Yeah? Okay, there we go. All right, hey everyone. Uh, just to begin, I wanna share a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a senior at Northview. Uh, yes sir, go Titans. Um, people who know me uh, pretty well would describe me as kind of a, a huge dork and kind of a nerd. Um, I love to talk about Star Wars and Marvel and just kind of movies in general. Um, and I love football, like I could seriously talk about football for like forever. Um, I've been running cross country at Northview since my freshman year. Yes, I'm one of those weird cross country kids. Yes, we are a cult. Um, <laughs> uh, I grew up uh, in a Christian household and uh, I always knew who God was. Um, I never really had a really hard time believing um, that you know, Jesus died for my sins. Um, I had two amazing parents um, that were there to help me and support me in my faith. I was involved in the middle school and high school ministries um, at my church. I was basically just uh, your typical goody two-shoes Christian kid. Um, so when my friend Alex invited me here to wash during my sophomore year, I was all in. Um, basically, I was killing it, um, or so I thought. Towards the end of my sophomore year, it came to the point where all the good decisions that I was making weren't enough to stop me from making some pretty bad ones as well. Before I could even blink, I was a totally different person, and I was left wondering where I went wrong. About halfway through my junior year, I was a shell of who I thought I was. Before I could... What I soon realized was that my perspective was off. Whatever I did for God, I was really just doing to check off boxes of being Christian and not disappointing my parents. What I realized was that God was a background character in a story that was all about me. Today, I'm going to read to you out of Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, and I'll show you what having the right perspective can do for you. So Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11 say this, But whatever our gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now to give y'all a little backstory on what we're reading, um, this was a letter, Philippians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. And now uh, Paul was a Jewish man who was born a Roman citizen, and what this means basically is that he was a celebrity. He became a leader in the Jewish church and basically was doing everything right that a man after God's heart could do. He even talks a few verses before this about his zeal and self-righteousness. He was basically a perfect follower of God. Then he encountered Jesus in a blinding light and for three days, stumbling around, he was lost. And at the end of the blindness, he followed God's call to spread the gospel to the nations. Because of this, he was beaten, persecuted, stoned, ridiculed for his faith. Paul is literally writing this letter from a Roman prison. And yet, you hear what he says? Verses 7 and 8, he says, But for whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul was this high and mighty figure before knowing God, before knowing Jesus, and, and here he is, sits in his prison cell where, for all he knows, he may die, and yet all of his status and good works towards God, before he met Jesus, all of that is rubbish to him? Paul knows that all of it pales in comparison to one thing, knowing Jesus. He has gained that new perspective on what it means to follow God. Verse 9, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of his own that comes from the law, 
but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Guys, there it is. We do not get God because of what we do. Because we follow the laws of the Bible. I feel like we miss that so much as people who grew up in the church. Or if you didn't grow up in the church, you may have this idea of Christianity that it's, it's all about earning your way to heaven. That it's your own merits and what you can give God. I feel like sometimes we're just too focused on doing the right thing and not doing it for the right reasons. We're fighting so hard to try to win our Father's approval by trying to impress Him, by trying to do all these good things, but your good things aren't good compared to God. God is holy, and we all dull in comparison. If you're a seeker in the room tonight, I need you to hear this. Actually, if you are in this room tonight, I need you to hear this. The God of the Bible did not send His perfect Son to die for you based off all the good deeds that you have to offer him. If he were that way, we would all be doomed to hell because God's standard on its own is perfection. We cannot be in the presence of a perfect God without ourselves being perfect. Instead, what God did was send the only one who truly deserved to be loved by him down to this broken, nasty, despicable earth and sacrificed him all so that he could have relationship with us. Why would he do that? Because he wants you. Not your works, not your perfect obedience as a prerequisite for salvation. No, he wants you. It took me until this year to fully realize that truth. And when Paul realized it, it changes everything for him. And it changed everything for me. The weight that was lifted off me when I realized God's love was unconditional. It was like I could finally breathe. It was a new life. We talk in church about this new life a lot, but what does it really mean? Well, Paul talks about this new life in the last two verses. Verses 10 and 11, he says, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's perspective has changed. He decides that he no longer wants to live the life that he was living before Jesus. His life that everyone around him probably seemed like it was about the best life that you could live. Instead, he now desires the death and the suffering that Jesus went through on earth. When Jesus spent time on earth, he was not hailed by all as the Messiah. He went through the worst kind of suffering and torture that the world had to offer at the time. This is something that I wish I had more time to touch on, but Jesus wasn't just put up on a cross where he peacefully fell into a deep sleep and never awoke again, which I know that sounds a little obvious, but I feel like we take for granted what he did and we just kind of seem like it was nothing. Jesus was whipped dozens of times with broken glass and metal. He had to force, he was forced to carry his cross up a hill where he was stabbed with a spear in the ribs, a crown of thorns jammed around his head, nailed by his hands and feet to a wooden cross. Every breath he took was an excruciating nightmare that went on for hours and hours until death ended his suffering. In the same way that Jesus died a physical death only to be resurrected by the Holy Spirit in a physical way, Paul now desires a spiritual death from his old ways so that he can be resurrected into new life by the Spirit. That's it, y'all. All that God will ask is that we leave our old, broken, selfish, flawed way of living behind and trust the new life, the better life that God has in store for us. Before I move on from this, I just want to say, new life does not mean we'll never sin again. Paul even acknowledges as much in verse 12 where he says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made, has made me his own. Goodness knows none of us in this room are perfect or will ever be perfect or even close, but it's about the fight. You don't stop playing the sport you love because you had one bad game. You just fight to get better. If you're a follower of God, his love and approval are not a result of you being obedient. We see love and obedience and we think we must obey first and then God will love me. When in reality, God loved us first. So now what do we do in response to that? We obey. We obey with the right perspective and motivation. We live differently because we desire to know God more. In the past few weeks, Tegan and Chase have 
talks about this idea of knowing God, about how knowing him isn't just knowing about him, right? Because all the PCS kids in here, all the people who grew up in church could, you know, they could name every book in the Bible. You crush it at Bible trivia night, but if someone were to ask us who God was in our lives, what would, be, what would our answer be? We shouldn't run after God with the perspective that we are chasing after what he can give us, but rather chasing after him and him alone. There's a really good question that I heard a while back that convicted me, and hopefully it'll convict you too. If you got to go to heaven, but Jesus wasn't there, would you still want to go? What are you really chasing? I have to wrap it up here, so... If, I've, if you take nothing else away from tonight, I want you to take this away. Your strongest inner motivations and perspective will determine your actions, the way that you live your life. I want you to really stop and think, but if you had no one around you to impress, no one to put a show on for, would you still run after God? For my believers in the room, do you have the right perspective on what it means to follow God? For my people in the room who are seeking God, if the new life that I talked about sounds interesting, appealing at all to you, then keep coming to wash. Keep listening to talks. Keep digging in. Keep talking to people about God. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Let's pray.